money if it's legitimate, but they're doing it to make money. Now, let's get into Agenda 21 specifically. In 1987, there was a commission, uh, the World Commission on Environment and Development, and it was chaired by a very brilliant lady, a Dr. Gro Harlem Brutland, who was once the director of the WHO, World Health Organization, an arm of the UN. You know you're in trouble when the WHO is coming to your door. <laughs> We're here to help you. She was the Prime Minister of Norway, and at the time of this commission was the Vice President of the World Socialists. So let me ask you sort of a rhetorical question. What type of plan do, do World Socialists have? Is it about freedom and limited government? Personal liberty? No, it's about control, right? That's what came out of here. And the term sustainability came out of this commission. And the term sustainability, the, the, the official definition, and it's sort of paraphrasing, is this. To meet the needs of the present generation without infringing on the needs of future generations. They don't say wants, they say needs. And it sounds, gee, it sounds reasonable, right? Obviously, some things aren't sustainable. But they don't mean that when they talk to each other. And I'll get into that in a few minutes. Well, 1992, in Rio de Janeiro, they had a conference. 18, over 18, I've heard a figure of 35,000, but 18 to lots of people from all over the world. Uh, we had a reporter from the New American Magazine, the man who wrote this article uh, was there, and he along with, uh, I think it was the governor, the former governor, of uh, Dixie Lee Ray of Oregon or Washington State, were the only handful of liberty type reporters there. And, and his article that I can give you on, on a PDF if you want, he said um, they were communist, Socialists, globalists, greenies, and diaper swamis. He actually said that he saw the same swamis in, in here that he saw in Rome when they had the International Criminal Court. It's almost like, you know, rent a swami. And uh, they do their you know, little, their little routines. And two of the diaper swamis, Al Gore and John Kerry. Al Gore is now a billionaire. He made his money mainly from lying to school children about global warming. Probably every single public school in the country has aired an inconvenient truth. It should be called an inconvenient lie. And by the way, Al Gore's daddy became, he was a senator as well, and he made, when he left the Senate, he, be, he was a lapdog for Armand Hammer, the Republican socialist who made money uh, from the oil business, right? And uh, he inherited mines, he got mines. And Al Gore has a home that's probably the size of all our homes put together, flies around in jet planes, has a big carbon footprint. But he's an elitist, and he's saving the world while he's becoming quite wealthy. By the way, he will not debate anybody on this subject. I had a chance to meet uh, the head of the Czech Republic, President of the Czech Republic, who then was the head of the European Union, who hated the European Union. And Gore won't be in the same, he'll walk out when we're in the same room together. The founder of the Weather Channel, John Coleman, he won't debate, Gore won't debate him. When Gore is speaking at a forum, the only reporters that show up are those that are pre-approved, and the only questions asked are the ones that they give to the reporter. And they comply with that. Okay, and John Kerry, yes, John Kerry has a yacht. Anybody in this room have a yacht? Well, why don't we form Occupy the Yacht Club? Because don't we have a right to a yacht? But we have a right to everything else, riding the MB, riding the subway and the right to, you know, to, uh, to free health care. Don't we have a right to a yacht and a solar panel? Uh, can I say one thing? There was a debate where he was going to keep it in Rhode Island or in Boston. That's right. No, he's Rhode Island. Taxes. That's right. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Rhode Island. Yeah. Now, uh, you know, another freebie. Um, this is in this book right here. This is the, right, the editor who supports Agenda 21. This is what he has to say about Agenda 21. Effective execution of Agenda 21 will require a profound reorientation of all human society, unlike anything the world has ever experienced. <clears throat> a major shift in the priorities of both governments and individuals, and unprecedented redeployment of human and financial resources. This shift will demand that a concern for the environmental consequences of every human action be integrated into individual and collective decision making at every level. That's their agenda. And people in, in some of these re recent articles that are going after folks like us and guys like Ed who are exposing this, they laugh at them. No, that, that's, it was just an obscure meeting 20 years ago. It has nothing to do with it. That's their agenda right there, you see. All human beings. There was a great book called Human Action by Von Mises. It had nothing to do with this. It had to do with limited government and freedom and free market. 
Now, Maury Strong is sort of the granddaddy of Agenda 21, okay? Uh, he said at the UN conference back in 92 that the biggest threat to the world isn't uh, people with, uh, isn't Muslim extremists, it isn't uh, people pointing nuclear missiles at us from Russia or China. The biggest threat to the world is the American middle class. And why is that? Because the American middle class has cars, single family homes, and consumption patterns, including eating meats. Anybody in this room fit that description? Maybe a couple of you, yes. Yeah. So maybe some of you would like to fit that description, right? Maury Strong, at the age of 14, he has no formal education, which is usually a good thing, right, for most people. Orville, Orville and Wilbur Wright had no formal engineering uh, skills. That's why they were able to fly that plane. Had they formal training, they would have said, you can't be done. He went to the sea at 14. At 18, he's working at the UN as a passcode clerk, basically a security guard with a tie, you know, in the blazer probably. When he was 25, he was running an oil company. He's a billionaire as well. Yeah. Oil, billionaire, right? How did he get that in seven years? He went to night school, right? Probably went to night school, but David Rockefeller tapped him on the shoulder and liked this young man, right? And um, 1990, this quote was from a 1990 publication. Try to do a search for it on the internet. I tried to find the, the actual article. I found lots of references to it, and when it first came out, I was aware of it. I may have even had an issue of, or a photocopy a publication called West, it was from British Columbia, it's a magazine, and a reporter by the name of David Wood spent some time with him. And by the way, this guy is a, a New Age devotee, has a big ashram in Colorado, property all over the place, very wealthy. When you have a billion dollars, you could probably afford a couple of uh, pieces of property. Um, doesn't worry, worry about paying the rent and the mortgage. He's talking about a book that he's writing, um, and he said this, isn't the only hope for the planet that the industrialized civilizations collapse. Isn't it our responsibility to help bring that about? Now here's this young reporter that was flabbergasted because he said, this guy can do it. He was also head of the World uh, Economic Forum. And uh, he wanted to say, oh, but I shouldn't be saying these things. Well, haven't we seen that happen? Not overnight. I just heard in Manchester, another company is closing, a printing company, 150 jobs. When's the last time you heard of a printing company opening and creating 250 jobs, right? When I do see a factory anywhere in my travels, I go, wow, what's that doing opening? Somebody's coming out of, uh, out of the chimney of that factory other than dead, you know, dead, dead, uh, dead leaves or, you know, some, I see, I see growth, you know, trees coming out of some of these chimney tops because they've been closed for a long time, right? So this man says that you are the biggest threat. He's the granddaddy of Jenna 21. You still want this thing in your town? Another Agenda 21 hero was at this conference in 92. He's since deceased. A World War II hero, to his credit, and a man who had some innovations in the uh, submarine technology. Well, at the bottom, he's, giving a, he's addressing these people at the Rio conference, and he said the bottom uh, paragraph here, an American-born child environmentally is too expensive to maintain to his or her adulthood in a world economy. By the way, the, the term world economy means socialist economy, when you see that term. Okay. American women must be subjected to some manner of regulation beyond licensing and mandatory abortion. How many of you ladies are okay with mandatory abortion? How about you daddies? Want to be licensed? You want this guy to, oh, he can't, but people that think like him to license you? He got a standing ovation when he said this. Seven months prior to that, the paragraph quote on the top, you can actually find that on the internet. Uh, UNESCO Courier. UNESCO stands for United Nations Environment, Science, Cultural Organization. You see, they don't want to just bring freedom to the world, peace to the world. They want to control the environment. They want to control the science, take over the culture. They want everything. And if you look at the UN Meditation Room at the UN headquarters, maintain, maintained by the Luc uh, Lucius Trust, it used to be called the Lucifer Trust, but the uh, Lucifer gets bad rap, gets bad press. A lot of people don't feel uncomfortable with that. So they change it to the Luc Luc uh, Lucius Trust. That's the UN for you, okay? This is the mindset of the people that gave us Agenda 21. And if you're a reporter from a liberal newspaper, quote that. And I'd like to know what you think of that. If you, if you agree with that, let us know. Now, um, after this conference, there was a number of things at this Agenda 21 conference, this real conference. Um, the Biodiversity Treaty, which I'll get into a little bit. 
Uh, there was a global warming agreement protocol which became law. Thankfully, we never passed the Kyoto Treaty, uh, so we weren't subjected to these ridiculous things. And by the way, uh, the United States has reduced its overall energy consumption by about a percent and a half over the last 10 or so years, maybe give or take a few. Um, that sounds, oh good, we're making progress. But it is interesting that China, Brazil, India, about 150% over the last 10 years. And most of it's coal and oil. Isn't that interesting, right? So we can shut off all the lights, all the cars, all the factories that's left, and it wouldn't have much of an impact, even if there were global warming, you see. Well, Daddy Bush, you know, New World Order Bush, he's the one that signed Agenda 21 as soft law. This wasn't something that was passed by Congress. This wasn't something, but every branch of the federal government is pushing Agenda 21. Okay? The conservative, Republican. So don't try to get caught in this Republican Democrat stuff because it was a Republican that gave it to us. A year later, old Slick Willie gets elected and he gives us the Presidential Office of uh, Sustainability. He gives the American Planning Association a million dollars to write planning for the whole country, and they do. Give me a million bucks, I might write a plan, but it won't be a little different than what they have, right? That's say no restrictions, no easements, uh, let it all be done locally. Um, he had one of his advisors, by the way, all of the, all but one were government employees. Can you know who the one advisor that was part of the private sector? It was Ken, Ken Lay of Enron. And you remember the scandal, oh, they're, 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 there's the conservatives, all crooks and criminals and thieves, yeah? He was a greenie. Big money in green. Okay? But you didn't hear that. Just like uh, Mr. Pickens, T. Boone Pickens, he's another big oil greenie, okay? loves the idea of Agenda 21. Uh, I don't have George H.W. Bush here, but he was also a disciple of Agenda 21. And Obama, very much so, of course. In fact, last summer he passed the uh, Rural Councils Act, Presidential uh, Rural Councils uh, Executive Order, yeah. setting up Agenda 21 in the rural communities. In other words, they want to get people off the what's left of the farm, just get them into the, and I'll show you what, what I mean by that in a few minutes. And by the way, again, Agenda 21 is not law. It's, it's just, here are the guidelines. And then the laws will be, be passed by, by going by these guidelines. So when people say, I don't see the word Agenda 21 anywhere, you probably won't see it. You go to the Inkley website, you're not going to see the word. It used to be up there, they took it down. Okay. Now, here's one of the, uh, uh, Clinton's advisors. And he's a big advocate of this Agenda 21. He lives in the northwest part of the country, I think, uh, Oregon. J. Gary Lawrence. He's speaking to a group in England in 1996. And he's saying this. Participating in a UN advocated planning process would very likely bring out many of the conspiracy fixated groups. By the way, it took a long time to get people's attention. Because when we were talking about this when it first came out, they were saying, boy, we thought you guys were off the wall. Now you've proven it. You've got, you got to be kidding. No way this is going to happen, right? This segment of a society who fear one world government and a UN invasion of the United States to which our individual freedom would be stripped away would actively work to defeat any elected official who joined the conspiracy. That's his own word, right? So let's call our processes something else, such as comprehensive planning, smart growth, uh, growth management. In other words, he said to his disciples, you must lie and deceive people. If you tell them the truth, they won't accept it, right? That's what, that's what they've been doing ever, ever since, okay? Here, out of Agenda 21 came this uh, map, this biodiversity map. We got this through Michael, Dr. Michael Kaufman, who will be at our camp speaking on the subject. Um, and he, along with a handful of people, stopped the biodiversity treaty, right, back in the mid-90s, because they had this map to show, and I'll explain it if you haven't seen it already. Um, but even though the treaty was defeated, it's being implemented right now and in New Hampshire, all over the country. The, uh, the red are what they call the uh, off-limits to, uh, to humans, okay, unless you're probably a disciple of Maurice Strong. The yellow are highly regulated buffer zones. There might be a little bit of human activity, but not a whole lot. And you can't really see the black, when I mean, it blew up the map, the death, the death resolution declined. But the black would be, um, Black would be the uh, densely populated uh, areas. We refer to them as Stackham and Patton communities. And some of the literature we have has a map. You can go on the internet and find that all over the place. And uh, again, it was defeated, but you see the heritage zones, 
You see the, um, uh, the inter international, uh, say the uh, World Heritage Sites, the UN sets these things up. Uh, federal, uh, national corridors, we see all over the, all over the country. We see land, uh, land trusts, some land trusts, not all, but a lot of them are working to gobble up land. I was in Winchenden, Massachusetts, and there was a map. In fact, my son caught it before I done training my son uh, to take in my footsteps. Uh, they had a little, you know, the definitions, uh, and it said uh, vernal pools, potential vernal pools. The vernal pools, once you're defined as vernal pools, that means you can't do much with that land anymore. But that's okay, a land trust will take it over, or we'll get a conservation easement, which you can sell to the federal government, you see. And we have little buffer zones and corridors, and one nice, it'll be like this. No, the 21 means 100 years. It's not going to be done in one election cycle. But it's a process, okay? And they get made a lot of inroads. What is normal years? That's a good question. You know, they can define it any way they want to. What is normal use? You know, what's a normal use of a farm? You can raise your crops, you know? That light yellow. About the second, the right column there. Normal use. Light uh, oh, oh, you know, well, you, know what? you don't see much here, do you? Oh, what normal use? Yeah. Yeah, 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 oh, yeah like Michigan, yeah. Yeah, you don't see much of that, do you? And then you see Maine? I was just up in Maine uh, last week. Uh, that area, that northwest tip of Maine, called the crown of Maine, that northwest tip is private timberland. It's the largest tract, probably, of private land. Yeah. And they're talking about some of it to be a federal park. You've got Baxter State Park, and you've got federal, they proposed federal park. They've got a proposed federal park in the Blackstone River Valley of Rhode Island, uh, Massachusetts. Okay. And, um, you know, these big nature conservancies and groups like that that work to implement Agenda 21. By the way, the head of the Nature Conservancy, Mark Turkek, I think, Tursek, he happens to be a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. And guess what banking community he's from? Goldman Sachs. Goldman, how did you know? <laughs> did you see my slides? <laughs> oh, yes, yes, yeah. Now, if I was presenting, if I was one of these facilitators, and I was uh, promoting Agenda 21 in your community, and after a couple of days of my instruction, I would say, okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want to show you the picture on the left, and you and I say, what's wrong with that picture? And you've been, you've been uh, you know, Agenda 21 or I's, and you bought into this after you know, spending many years in public education, you'd say, well, Hal, it's obvious. Uh, single family homes, bad, unsustainable. Driveways, that means you have cars. That means you have affluence, bad. Backyards, which means you probably have barbecues, which means you have lawnmowers that are bad, right? Uh, did, you, did you say guns? Garden. Oh, a garden. Well, we like gardens as long as they use certain seeds, you know, that... Uh, they want you yeah. to use their garden. Yeah, use their garden, that's right, yeah. I don't see any windmills there, right? That's not good. Uh, and it also means middle-class wealth. So how do you solve it? The picture on the right, the stack of impacting communities. Small units, densely populated, uh, no cars, no backyards. Don't don't go to yards and buy stuff. Get, get no place to put it. Now, at the at the private sector, a lot of people like living there. That's fine. This is subsidized stuff. Okay. And is it happening here in New Hampshire? No. We're all concerned. We're all freedom advocates here. That won't happen. Well, someone wasn't watching the, sh the store, folks. I was in Nashua. Now I get to Nashua. Most of us get to Nashua regularly, right? No big deal. Uh, we had a presentation. Uh, back in October at the library with a little bit more, not a lot more, but a group like this. We had a, little state, a couple of state officials, elected officials there, and uh, no media coverage that particular day. No, the radio stations didn't want to give us any airtime. Okay, that's their prerogative. Um, Nashville belongs to ICLE, which I'll be talking about in a few minutes. We weren't getting any answers. Some of our members and friends in Nashville were calling the mayor. Never heard of ICLE. So uh, they call them Alderman. Never heard of ICLE. We don't know what Agenda 20 was. Never heard of it, right? I take a walk down Main Street and I come across this storefront called Renaissance Downtown. You may want to take a note of this entity. And I thought, gee, what's this? I looked in and there was a gigantic map of Nashua. I said, uh oh. Uh, had my little trusty uh, video camera and uh, camera. I walked in there, a very nice young lady came up and she says, oh, can I help you? I said, yes, I'd like to get information on your organization. She gave me a nice little folder. I open it up and it's smart growth. You know, all this kind of comprehensive planning. And I took pictures. I said, okay, take some pictures. And I found this. It's a little glare, but they had an easel. It says, what is smart growth? The word Agenda 21 does not appear on their website or any of the literature they gave me, but they are promoting it. I said, have you heard of Agenda 21? She says, no. Well, we're having a presentation. Here's a flyer about the meeting we're having. 
for some reason, no one showed up from your group. I don't know why. But when I gave the presentation, one of the ladies in the audience said, uh, some of you may know her, um, uh, Kathy Peterson. She said, uh, they come to our committee meetings or our council meetings and they say, no more single family homes in Nashville. We get too many as it is. I asked this lady, this young lady, where's the money coming from? She said federal and state and some from the city. And they have a nice development right on the river, a nice stack of impact community. And they, they built one in Bristol, Connecticut. They've got some on Long Island. Okay, so now something you need to know, learn about too. Uh, it's not talked about too much. Benefit corporations. Have we heard of benefit corporations? Good, you've learned something. In fact, there's been a lot of these things. Um, a benefit corporation is where a state define, has a new, a new legal definition for a company or business. A certified green. In other words, if you're a certified green company, you will get that government contract, you will get that city contract, or that local contract, and maybe even that private contract. And they pass a layer of law, they certify you as green from a Kool-Aid stand to a construction company, right? And right now, about seven or eight states are now benefit corporations. There's a website called benefitcorporations.net. Go to that website, they'll have model legislation, how Yustin can become a benefit corporation. Mussolini was honest. He said, we're fascists. These folks are promoting green fascism, okay? And a lot of these companies are buying into it because they want to meet payroll. Most of them aren't disciples of Al Gore or Maury Strong. They're in a slumping economy. They think, I've got to make payroll. I've got to stay in business. So they go along and get along, okay? I had a chance with Dave Kopatz. Some of you might need to know Dave Kopatz. We spoke to a group in, uh, a builders group in Pennsylvania. A man from the Pennsylvania Builders Association was on hand. He said, we used to have 13,000 members in 07. We're down to 6,500. And I'm not saying it's all because of Agenda 21. There's other factors. I've said, these folks better put some of their money to fight this instead of go along with it, because there won't be many companies left. So you see already uh, California, uh, Hawaii, Virginia, New Jersey, Vermont, uh, New, I was told New York passed it, but there was some kind of discrepancy in the, in the two bills in the both houses, so I'm not sure if it's gone. But it's pending in, in Michigan, and it may be pending here. It may be somewhere in New Hampshire. Now, New Jersey has a lot of success in getting rid of Agenda 21 in certain areas, but you know what happened? They passed Benefit Corporation, the House and the Senate and the Governor, just without any opposition. They didn't even know what it was. And one of my friends down there that's been fighting this tooth and nail and having a lot of success he got back to me and said, what in the, you know what, is the benefit corporation? I says, well, these folks are very clever. If they can't get you that way, they're going to get you that way or that way, you see. So, okay, now I was up in Maine, uh, as I mentioned, and Maine was able to uh, defund an arm of Agenda 21 called Gateway One, the governor. Some of our members and other freedom type people approached him and said, this is coming from the UN. He defunded it, so you think, oh, we're all set. At the State House, I pick up a little brochure from the Maine Economic Growth Council. Founded in 1993, a year after Rio, right? And uh, it's one of these private partnership things, private government partnership type things. You have elected officials and you have people in the corporate business world, right? And uh, I, 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 what got my attention, the word sustainable was on it. On the, on the, and I open it up and there is, I refer to this as the green swastika. <laughs> uh, it's different languages, community, economy, environment. Every Agenda 21, that's their logo. What's it doing in Maine? Right? It's in New Hampshire, it's in Maine, it's everywhere. It's this little logo, right? It sounds very nice, too, by the way. And, oh, they have an interesting statistic. They, there's more poverty in Maine in the last seven years. There's more obesity. So, by, by the, that information there, fat people cause poverty, right? Right? You know why? They, they can't afford to eat good stuff, so they need to jump. Maybe that's why. I don't know. So. They don't have anything else to do with it. Hudson, New Hampshire. I got this, I think uh, it was Friday, last Friday, and I think Ed has something to do with this. Hudson does not belong to Ickley, they belong to sustainable communities. And this was signed off last year in August by the selectmen, and somebody told me that, I know this guy, he would never do that. He probably doesn't have any idea what he's doing. Uh, I'll answer questions at the end, yeah. Um, but they're getting money. They're getting money from the state and the federal governments, okay? Mostly from the federal governments. It's called the Granite State Futures Agreement. The Granite State Futures Agreement. Okay. Now here's a green company that's building a green high school in New, New, uh, in, in, uh, New Han um, Denham, Massachusetts. They've been around since 18, 1905. Now, if I'm owning a company, 
and I'm in this economy, of course I'm going to recycle. Of course I'm going to be a wise steward of my, my scarce resources. I want to maximize my profits. I don't need Al Gore to tell me how to do it. You see, Al Gore didn't make his money the old-fashioned way. Well, maybe he did. He inherited it, right, and made more. Um, now let's get into ICLEI. The International Council for Local Environmental Initiative, Local Governments for Sustainability. They were founded two years before Rio, and they probably wrote most of the Agenda 21 along with this entity called the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, which is sort of a you know, background organization that has a ton of influence, right? Dr. Kaufman has done a lot of exposure of that particular entity. Now, uh, they have about 12,000 members. Now, I say members, not individuals, but cities, towns, and counties. They do have some non-government type groups. The State Department funds ICLEI, right? And HUD funds ICLEI. And they do have, uh, they have an office in Boston, they have an office in San Francisco, but they're headquartered in Bonn, right? And uh, if your city or town belongs to this, you've basically been, your charter has been put over the shelf, and now they have the ICLEI charter. You don't know who the world, there's a world secretary, I love that term, secretariat, right? Uh, he's, I think he's the former president, David Cadman. Most people have no idea because they didn't vote for ICLEI. ICLEI just shows up because of selectmen or maybe a town manager fills an application and sends them a check. Here is the Burgermeister. If you're a town, here's the Burgermeister of Nashua, right? Uh, Conrad Otto Zimmerman. We thought we got rid of these guys in 45, but they're back now. Not to worry about U boats, they're now here in your cities. Okay, and I think it's important to point out too. Back in the 90s, when a lot of folks were worried about a UN occupational troop, you know, uh, blue guy, guys with blue helmets and, you know, taking over the towns. We don't need to have UN troops come in, folks. We brought them in. Our friends brought them in. Our neighbors, our family members. Maybe the woman who babysat you when she was a teenager, who's now a select person, a select woman. They're the ones that brought in Agenda 20. They brought the UN in, okay? So we don't need to worry about uh, the scary scenarios. They're here and they're brought in by these, uh, these folks our own neighbors and friends, even those in our churches, if we attend churches, they're the ones that brought in Agenda 21. Here's the leadership, people from all over the world, nobody's ever heard of these folks, unless, you, unless you're an Agenda 21 uh, supporter, then you've heard of them. Okay, uh, now why is it, uh, ICLEI a problem? ICLEI is not an NGO, some people call it an NGO, and it doesn't quite meet that description, non-government organization. An NGO is certified by the UN, and they have to promote the, the, the values enshrined in the UN Charter, you see. So, uh, uh, so there are a lot of private organizations that belong there are called NGOs. Now, it's a generic term as well, but there's a definition, and it's a UN, something that's been approved by the UN. But if a town or a city or a county belong, that's not a non-government, that's a government organization. So to me, it's a government-to-government -government international organization that violates the US Constitution in at least two places. Article 1, Section 10 says that states cannot confederate. That means New Hampshire can't join the European Union or the Asian Economic Conference. And if they can't do it, there's subdivisions. States and counties and towns can't do it either. But they did in many cases. And by the way, if you, your town doesn't have to belong to ICLEI to promote ICLEI's views, if it's a member of this grand state, cons, cons, um, that you just mentioned, sustainable New Hampshire, they use the ICLEI software and the ICLEI guidelines and the suggestions and proposals and resolutions and regulations. Also, Article 4, Section 4, it says that uh, all states are guaranteeing what kind of government? Not a democracy, but a republic, right? You can't have a republican form of government and ICLEI running your town at the same time. When I say running, it isn't that they have any legal right to run your town. The people in that town just sort of let them, we're going to adopt your proposals and run with them. See. Here are uh, various towns and cities around every state in the Union, and I think we, someone mentioned Epping, added, I thought there was only four in New Hampshire, Nashua, Wolfboro, Portsmouth, Keene, and uh, someone mentioned Epping. Uh, so maybe there's one have left, but maybe there's a couple more that we don't know about. They do take, they don't always, when people, when towns leave Eckley, they're not so fast to take them off their website, you know. But when a new one comes up, it goes right up there. So. So the numbers may be a little confusing at times. I was in Michigan, and this a handful of Michigan. Yeah, and another one here. Connecticut, Green, uh, Green Schools, Massachusetts. Had uh, 38, we're down to I think 34 now. I just heard Waltham left, and I'm glad to hear that. Massachusetts has something that's even worse. 
they have green communities. Massachusetts, the great general court passed this thing about three years ago. So, and they encourage you to join Italy. It looks better on your resume. 